In the consideration of the faculties and impulses of the prima bella, of the human soul, the phrenologists have failed to make room for prosperity, which although obviously existing is a radical, primitive, irresuitable sediment, has been equally overlooked by all moralists who have preceded them. In the pure arrogance of the reason, we all overlooked it. We have suffered its existence to escape our senses solely through want of belief, of faith. Whether it be faith in Revelation or faith in Kabbalah, the idea has never occurred to us simply because of its supererogation. We saw no need of the impulse for the prosperity. We could not perceive its necessity. We could not understand that it is to say we could not have understood. Had the notion of the premium mobile ever obtruded itself, we could not have understood in what manner it might made further the objects of humanity, either temporal or eternal. It could be not be denied that phrenology and in great measure all metaphysicism have been concocted a priori. The intellectual or logical man, rather than the understanding or observant man, set himself to imagine designs, to dictate purposes to God. Having this fathom to his satisfaction, the intentions of Javah, out these intentions, he built his innumerable systems of mind in the matter of phrenology. For example, we first determined naturally enough that it was design of the deity the man should eat, and this origin and the scourge with which in the deity compels man, will I, nil I, into eating. Secondly, having settled into the God's will, man should continue his species. We discovered an organ of amativeness for worth, and so with combativeness and ideality, with casualty, with constructiveness. So in short, with every organ, whether representing a prosperity, a moral sentiment, or a faculty of the pure intellect, and then the arrangement of the principia of human action, the spurts, whether right or wrong, in part or upon the whole, have but followed in principle the foot predecessors, reducing and establishing everything. It would have been wiser, it would have been safer to classify, if classify we must, upon the basis of what usually, if occasionally did, and was always occasionally doing, rather than being upon the basis of what we took it for, granted the deity intended him to do. If we cannot comprehend God in his thoughts that call the works into being, if we cannot understand him in his objective creatures, how then is his substantive moods in the phases of creation, induction, a posterior, but have brought phrenology to admit as an innate and permitted principle of human action, a paradoxical something which we may call perverseness, for want of a more characteristic term, has not been tormented, for example, by an earnest desire to tantalize a listener by circumlocution. The speaker is aware that he is displeases. He has every intention to please. He is usually curt, precise, and clear. The most laconic and luminous language is struggling for utterance upon his tongue. It is only with difficulty that he restrains himself from giving it flow. He dreads, and the anger of him whom he addresses yet, the thought strikes him, that by certain involutions, and parenthesis, this anger may be endangered. A single thought is enough. The impulse increases to a wish, the wish to a desire, the desire to an uncontrollable longing, and the longing to the deep regret and mortification to the speaker, and in the defiance of all consequences, is indulged. We are consumed with eagerness, to commence the work with the anticipation of whose glorious result our whole sins are on fire it must it shall be undertaken today and yet we put it off until tomorrow and why there is no answer except that we feel perverse using the word with no comprehension of the principle the idea of what would be our sensations during the sweeping precipity of a fall from such a height and this fall this rushing annihilation for the very reason that it involves the most ghastly and loathsome of all the most ghastly and loathsome images of death and suffering which have ever presented themselves to imagination. For this very cause do we now the most vividly desire it. And because our reason violently deters us from the brink, therefore do we the most impetuously approach it. There is no passion in nature so demonically impatient as that of whom shuddering on upon the edge of a precipice thus meditates a plunge. To indulge for a moment in any attempt at thought is to be inevitably lost, for reflection but urges us to forbear, and therefore it is, I say, that we cannot. I rejected a thousand schemes because their accomplishment involved the chance of detection. At length, in reading some French memoirs, I found an account of a nearly fatal illness that occurred in the Madame Palou. Through the agency of a candle, accidentally poisoned, the idea struck my fancy. And once I knew my victim's habit of reading in bed, 
I knew too that his apartment was narrow and ill-ventilated, but I need not vex you with the impenitent details. I need not describe the easy artifices by which I substituted in his bedroom candle stand a wax light of my own making for the one which I there found. The next morning he was discovered dead in his bed, in the corner of the was dead at the visitation of God. It harassed because it haunted. I could scarcely get it out of my head. It's quite a common thing to be thus annoyed with the ringing in our ears or rather in our memories of the burden of some ordinary song or some unimpressive snatches from an opera, nor will be the less tormented of the song if the pondering itself offer meditations. I catch myself pondering upon my security and repeating in a low undertone a phrase, I am safe. In a fit of petulance, I remodeled thus, I am safe, I am safe, yes, if it be fool not enough to make an open confession. No sooner had I spoken this word, I felt an icy chill that creep down my spine. I the trouble to explain, and I remember, I remember, I might possibly be fool enough to confess the murder for which I had been guilty, confronted me as the very ghost of whom I had murdered, and beckoned me on the death. I would have done it, but a rough voice was sounding in my ears, a rough and grass breath. For a moment I experienced all the pangs of suffocation, I became blind and death and giddy, and then some invisible fiend I thought struck me with his broad, broad upon the back. The long and present is to birth my soul. I did it! I did it! Ryan, right, come back! Ryan, <laughs> right, come back! Are we done with him? I think we are.